Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a series about the two small books in the Old Testament entitled Ezra and Nehemiah after the two most important characters in those books. And this lesson is number 12 in that series for December 21 of 2019 entitled Dealing with Bad Decisions. Hmm, that doesn't sound like too much fun. But anyway, let's see what happens and what we can learn from these experiences. But as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we now bow our heads before you, recognizing your wisdom and your guidance. We thank you so much for these records of people so long ago who stood valiantly for your cause and did marvelous things for your returning people. We ask now that as we prepare for the time of trouble that's ahead of us, for difficult times in our world, that we will have, be, have the courage to stand up as they did, not to be deceived or misled by any of your enemies, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this lesson is going to focus particularly on one of the major challenges that Ezra and later Nehemiah faced when they tried to restore the nation of Israel to its God-intended ideal. They, I mean, they all knew. I'm sure even everybody in the groups that returned must have had a pretty good idea that they would live in a place that was surrounded by hostile nations who were at the same time idolatrous and fertility cult worshippers. Back in the days of Ahab and Jezebel, and many people don't recognize this, but Jezebel was the, as the daughter of the high priest of Baal over in Sidon. She was the high priestess of Baal, and she was determined to convert. She was a missionary. She believed she was a missionary. She was determined to convert the people of the northern kingdom to become Baal worshippers. Unfortunately, she was very successful. You remember that she employed 850 priests to accomplish that task at one time that we know about, 1 Kings 18, 19. Even earlier, we know the story of Balaam, recorded in Numbers 23 and following. And then the experience with the Moabitess, Moabitess women, recorded in Numbers 25 and the devastating effect it had on the Israelites. Balaam knew something that we all should recognize, that is, The people of God could only be conquered if they turned away from their worship of the one true God. Wow. We've already talked about the problem of Sabbath worship and shutting the gates to keep the traitors outside outside on the Sabbath and Nehemiah closing the gates. So we also have discussed the fact that the children of Israel had stopped paying a faithful tithe probably for several reasons, but for those from the tribe of Levi who were dependent upon the tithes, it was necessary to return to their farms to try to support themselves. Now we will deal with one of the major challenges that affected both Ezra and Nehemiah at different times in their attempts to rehabilitate the Jews. And you want to introduce us to that idea, Dennis? Nehemiah 13, 23-25. At that time I also discovered that many of the Jewish men had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half their children spoke the language of Ashdod or some other language and didn't know how to speak our language. I reprimanded the men, called down curses on them, beat them, and pulled out their hair. (laughs) Then I made them take an oath in God's name that never again would they or their children intermarry with foreigners. It's from the Good News uh, Translation. I think that was a convincing argument. <laughs> Beat them and pulled out oh, their hair. <laughs> yeah. Well, remember it, it, Ezra. It work for a time, as God has found that force works for a short period of time. Yeah. But not long term. Try to imagine this now. Even though those children had Jewish fathers, those who did not speak Aramaic, the language used during the during and after the exile, or Hebrew, could not have understood the teachings of the Scripture. So. I mean, if you're a father and you're raising children that can't even speak your language, how convincing is your religion? Jewish men, many of them from among the Jewish leaders, we might point out, had married wives from Ammon, Ashdod, and Moab. Ashdod was a city in the Philistine territory. Ammon and Moab 
were countries to the east inhabited by the descendants of Lot. And do you remember who came from one of those cities who gave the Nehemiah a really bad time? Nehemiah. There was Sanballat and Tobiah. 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 Tobiah, and yeah. where where did Tobiah come from? Wasn't it Tobiah? I think so. He had an apartment there in the in the temple yeah. or something. But he was a leader of the Ammonites. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Wow. <clears throat> well, we know about the story of Boaz. So let's let's look at other examples we know about. We know about the story of Boaz and Ruth. Ruth was a young woman who chose to... And where did she come from? Moab. Moab. She chose to follow God's Israel's God and went with Naomi to live in Bethlehem. No one had any problem with assimilating this young woman into the Jewish religion and nation. Why was that? Well, what was different? She was converted. Yeah, she accepted the Jewish religion. Yeah, she was happy to be integrated with the Jewish religion. Although the first uh, Redeemer turned her down because he didn't want to soil his heritage. So okay. some had, some had little questions concern. about her. Huh? There were probably some who had followed the, that example in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. There were probably some, almost certainly some, who the women joined their husbands, chose to raise their children and their families according to their Jewish heritage, and probably nobody had any problems with those people. But the real problem was the fact that others had moved into Jewish territory while continuing their idolatrous and fertility cult practices of worship. So let's be very clear. What was the problem? Was it the fact that they came from somewhere else? No, it was the way they were worshiping. It was their religious practices. It, I mean, if you just let people just infiltrate, even into the highest levels of the country, and they're worshiping Baal, etc., What's going to happen? It was bad enough with, even without that kind of influence, but, you know. Well, Deuteronomy 28 outlines the curses that would fall upon those who disobeyed God. It is likely that Nehemiah was publicly shaming those rebels and calling down on them the words of God from Deuteronomy 28. And Margaret, I think you have something about that. Okay, this is from uh, more Deuteronomy 28. Moreover, when the text says that Nehemiah beat some of the men and pulled out their hair, instead of seeing Nehemiah in a rage and reacting with fury, we should note that a beating was a prescribed form of public punishment. This kind of behavior was applied only to some of them, meaning to the leaders who caused or promoted this wrong behavior. These acts were to serve as methods of public shaming. Nehemiah wanted to ensure that the people understood the gravity of their choices and the results that would ensue from them. And this is from the Adult Sabbath School Less, Less Bible Study Guide for Sunday, December 15. Well, how should we respond if we see wrongdoing take place in the church today? I, Matthew 18. Hmm? Matthew 18, Jesus yeah, said to exactly. go to them personally, personally and then they didn't hear you don't hear don't not willing to listen to you go with one or two others if they're not willing to listen to you then what do you do and you take it to the church you take it to the church if they're still not willing to listen and treat them as an outsider and go and work on them evangelize them so treating them as, as an outsider the third step doesn't mean shunning them it means no. trying to convert them trying to yes. change them well so what does God expect of us for today? How should we respond if the wrongdoing is done by an individual? Well, we've just suggested Jesus' guidance in Matthew 18. What if we feel that the wrongdoing is being done by the church as a whole or by its leaders? We can communicate with them and seek to give them our input okay. and the choice to change their mind. Jim, do you have something more about that? Nehemiah talking, Good News Bible, Nehemiah 13, starting with 26. I said it was foreign women that made King Solomon sin. He was a man who was greater than any of the kings of other nations. 
God loved him and made him king over all Israel, and yet he fell into this sin. Are we then to follow your example and disobey our God by marrying foreign women? Do you remember the name that was given to Solomon in his early years by God? Jedediah. Jedediah. What does it mean? Beloved Beloved of of God. Yeah. Wow. Certainly the story of Solomon would have been familiar to all of the Jewish people. They recognized Solomon's sins and the fact that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. A careful, and by the way, he built all those pagan shrines on the top of Mount, Mount Olives. Many of the ruins of those shrines were still there in Jesus' day. Hmm. Still there in Jesus' day. A thousand years later, almost. A thousand years later. A thousand wives, quote-unquote. How would he even remember their names? (laughs) He got out his iPad and he checked it. (laughs) No, I mean... A careful review of Israelite history shows... Well, and and I have another question for you. How long would it take him to marry all of them? A long time. Well, he was a busy man. (laughs) You would would have to marry... A wedding lasted a week or so, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, you would be continuously getting married for 20 years to marry a thousand wives. Unless you married them in groups. Yeah. <laughs> I I'm sorry. Group marriage. The, the idea is what it did. Never thought of that. Cracks me up. <laughs> That's pretty. <laughs> wow. Anyway, a careful review of Jew- Israelite history shows that his high taxes and his marriage to these foreign women led to the breakup of the Israelite nation into Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Mm -hmm. This was directly contrary to the instructions given by Moses. Gordon? Deuteronomy 17, starting with verse 14 from the Good News Bible. After you have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is is going to give you and have settled there, then you are to decide then you will decide you need a king like all the nations around you. Make sure that the man you choose to be king is the one whom the Lord has chosen. Can I interrupt for just a second? How long was it between the time when Moses made this prophecy and the time they actually got a king? Well, close to 400 years. Around 400 years. That's another prophecy. And exactly fulfilled. Okay, And Moses was a prophet. He mu- so was God. Mm. He must be one. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Absolutely. He must be one of your own people. Do not make a foreigner your king. The king is not to have a large number of horses for his army. Did, you want to explain why is, that? So it's, the well, horses are for offensive for purpose, yeah. for war. They're for war. Not for defense. Yeah, exactly. Continuing, and he is not to send people to Egypt to buy horses, because the Lord has said that his people are never to return there. The king is not to have many wives, because this would make him turn away from the Lord, and he is not to make himself rich with silver and gold. Does any of this sound a little bit like Solomon? All of it. Just the opposite of what's advised. Wow. Wow. Continuing in verse 18, when he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's laws and teachings made from the original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. Do you think that any of the high priests and Levites and the people like that knowing that they must have known this verse and this passage, did they try to make sure that they got copies of this given to the kings? What a difference it would have made if they had... Mm. Well, hopefully they tried and hopefully they gave it, but yeah. perhaps the king was so resistant that he wouldn't. Uh, the yeah. kings yeah. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't follow through. Continuing in verse 20, this will keep him from thinking that he is better than his fellow Israelites and from disobeying the Lord's commands in any way. Then he will reign for many years and his descendants will rule Israel for many generations. 
Wow. Try to imagine what the nation would have been like if each of the kings had followed those directions. Hmm. How about if any of them had? Yeah. Yeah. You think David might have? Well, not really. He might have had the scroll there, but he's had multiple wives. Yep. He got a whole collection of wives before he became king. Yeah. A bunch more after he became king. Yeah. At the point of becoming king, he inherited all the wives of the previous king. Well, in the passage from Genesis 6, there's we recommend reading Genesis 6, 1 to 4, Genesis 24, 3 and 4, Genesis 28, 1 and 2, Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4, and 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to get some ideas about that. In the passage from Genesis 6, maybe, I think we have time, let me just read those first four verses. When the human race had spread all over the world and daughters were being born, some of the, hev- some of the heavenly beings, those are the ones that are called the sons of God, saw that these young women were beautiful, so they took the ones they liked. Then the Lord said, I will not allow people to live forever. They are mortal. From now on, they will live no longer than 120 years. In those days and even later, there were giants on the earth who were descendants of human beings, uh, uh, human, human women and the heavenly beings. They were great heroes and famous men a long ago. You know that in the King James Version, in more of the traditional version, um, it talks about the sons of God and the sons of men. And who were the sons of God and who were the sons of men? Sons of God were the, fall, were the descendants of Seth. Okay. The sons of men were the descendants of Cain. So why does my Good News Bible say, call the sons of God heavenly beings? I don't know. Okay, you need to know a little bit about the Hebrew language. When, when Jesus called him the son, himself the son of man, or the son of God, what is he saying? He's not saying he was somehow physically born from God, by definition, if you want to say someone belongs to something, it's a son of that person or a daughter of that person. So to say that uh, a son of man means a human being, son of God means a divine being. So here we have sons of God being interpreted as heavenly beings. Now we know that they weren't really heavenly beings. Uh, in this case, they were literally sons of people who followed God. Um, so a little, just a little bit of Hebrew uh, teaching there. In the so why does the Good News Bible put it that way? Because that's what it means, or that's what it could mean. That's one of the possible interpretations. Sons of God means heavenly beings. And to a Hebrew, they would be, and that's what it would mean to a Hebrew. It would, but it could mean a heavenly being, or it could be, uh, a, a, a being here on this earth who was following God, and both of those meanings are in, are could be in, expressed as expressed as sons of God. Deuteronomy thirty two, eight and nine, uh, chapter, verse eight, uh, in the Septuagint, and the RSV, the ESV, use as sons of God. The Masoretic texts use uh, sons of Israel. Mm-hmm. But it's really the, the oldest, oldest text in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls also is used sons of God. And you, you turn to the book of Ezekiel, for example, and he's con- constantly referred to as son of man. So what does that mean? It means human being. Um, we, if, if I say to you, if we were just talking about something and I say, if I were to say to you as a group of Adventist Christians, the son of man, and immediately you would think of who? Yes. You think about Jesus, because that's a name he preferred to call himself. But literally that means human being. Mm-hmm. And he's trying to emphasize the fact that he chose to make himself or allow himself to be made as a human being. But he's also a son of God, which means a heavenly being, a, a descendant, I mean, a God, divine person. The uh, apocryphal book of... Uh, Book of Enoch has some mythical kinds of things where uh, heavenly beings mate with, you know. Yeah. So I, I think that sort of per, you know perverts some yeah. of the scholarly logic. Although yeah. Paul says to not pay attention to Jewish myths, mm-hmm. he's yeah. probably talking about things like that. 
Well, these women who are called the daughters of men, directed were they? These women are called by the do, called the daughters of men, directed by Satan himself, in accomplishing what they did. Were these women attractive naturally? Probably, or were they part of a fertility cult worship like the women of Moab in Numbers twenty-five, or both? Maybe. Likely both. Well, pretty good chance. Well, in Genesis 24 and again in Genesis 28, Abraham, or Abram, and later Isaac, while living in the land of Canaan, arranged for their sons to get wives from their home country rather than take wives from the pagan fertility cult worshiping Canaanites. Moses gave very strict instructions about marrying such women. And what were those instructions? Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4. Do not marry any of them, and do not let your children marry any of them, because then they will lead your children away from the Lord to worship their other gods. If that happens, the Lord will be angry with you and destroy you at once. Okay, so what was the problem? Is it because they're Moabites or Ammonites or Ethiopians? No matter what they were. Yeah. It is clear that what these women were do, men were doing in Ezra's and uh, Nehemiah's day was in direct defiance of God's directions. But we need to remember that Moses married Zipporah, a Midianite woman. But clearly she had chosen to join Moses in his worship of the true God. Remember, she was the daughter of a faithful God-serving father and family. So these commands were not about marrying someone from a different nationality. I want to make that very clear. They were about accepting into your family someone with different religious practices, including idolatry and fertility cult worship. And perhaps most important, keeping those practices. Yes. yes. Not just starting with them, but yeah. continuing with them. Would you agree that the Bible gives us directions for living our lives that would lead to maximum happiness? Yes. Does the command not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever help to maintain our happiness? Should, right? There would be less strife yeah. in the home. After revealing what Ezra and Nehemiah did to those who were practicing idolatry and had, and had married Jewish men, do you think the Pharisees felt that their religion maximized their happiness and that they were authorized in dealing very harshly with anyone who did not do what they told them to do? If you read this kind of story on a regular basis and maybe you would even memorize these passages... Would you say, I want to be an Ezra? Well, and then you have the disciples who, uh, when they encountered the Samaritans and were treated rudely, they asked Jesus, shall we call fire down from heaven? And they could reference Elijah yeah. and what he did. So mm -hmm. Then Jesus rebuked them for doing so. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't know what spirit you're of, uh, for the Son of Man did not come to uh, destroy life, but to save it. Okay, let's turn. I'm, I'm not going to take time to read this whole chapter, but turn to Ezra 9. After all this had been done, talking about everything getting settled and getting the temple established, etc., some of the leaders of the people of Israel came and told me that the people, the priests and the Levites, had not kept themselves separate from the people in the neighboring countries of Ammon, Moab, and Egypt, or from the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Amorites. So, Let's understand this clearly. Who's reporting to who? Leaders are reporting to Ezra, is it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, some of the ordinary people, right? They were doing the same disgusting things that those people did. So what's happening here now? They're practicing the disgusting practices of the pagans and the fertility cult religious worshipers, right? Mm -hmm. Jewish men were marrying foreign women and so God's holy people had become contaminated. The leaders and officials were the chief offenders. When I heard this, I tore my clothes in despair, tore my hair and my beard, Instead and sat hair. down crushed with grief. So Ezra is tearing out his own hair. <laughs> Nehemiah comes along later and he says, I'm not wasting my time tearing out my hair. He's pulling their He's hair. He's pulling out their hair. I sat there grieving at all the time for the evening sacrifice to be offered, and people began to gather around me. All those who were frightened because of what the... <laughs> ...about the 
sins of those who had returned from exile. When the time came for the evening sacrifice, I got up from where I had been grieving and still wearing my torn clothes. I knelt in prayer and stretched out my hands to the Lord my God and said, Oh God, I am too ashamed to raise my head in your presence, etc. A beautiful prayer uh, there. Anyway. So, when Ezra heard about all the men who had rebelled against God's directions, and unfortunately they were religious leaders, many of them who did this, uh, had married foreign women who were still idolaters, he tore his clothes in despair, tore out his hair and his beard, and sat down in grief. He sat for a long period of time in mourning with torn clothes. Other people gathered around him in sympathy. When the time came for the evening sacrifice, he got up and went in and knelt before God in prayer. His prayer resembled in some ways the prayer of Daniel recorded in Daniel 9. He recalled the terrible sins that had led them into captivity in the past. And then he wondered if it was really possible that people would run back to those same evil practices. He even stated in Ezra 9.13, We know that you, are God, have punished us less than we deserve and have allowed us to survive in my good news Bible. The word the word word used in this passage about separating from foreigners is also used in Leviticus ten ten. Let's look at that for a second. You must distinguish there's a verb, distinguish between what belongs to God and what is for general use, between what is ritually clean and what is unclean. So what does that imply? Is that a very clear distinction? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Look at eleven forty seven. You must be careful to distinguish between what is ritually clean and unclean, between animals that may be eaten and those that may not. Again, that's a pretty clear distinction. And go on. You can read Exodus twenty-six thirty-three and Genesis talking about day and night in Genesis 1. And these passages is very clear that the word, word means to be separate and absolutely distinct, even opposite. For example, night and day. There is no question about the fact that God intended for there to be a broad and unchanging barrier between his true worshippers and idolaters. It is important to notice that the people themselves were the ones who approached Ezra to discuss the issue of intermarriage. Is this because they couldn't afford to marry women from other countries and so they were envious of the men who did? No, I don't think so. I hope not. It is disturbing to realize that it was the civil leaders the civil leaders who brought the, this news to Ezra because the spiritual leaders, the priests and Levites, were perhaps the ones most guilty of this transgression. Today, would that be the ministers mm-hmm. and conference officials? Do you have to get so specific? I, I'm asking a question. And the answer is yes. The equivalent. Mm. Yeah. So it's not us. Of course not. No, not any of us. Not any Sabbath school no, leaders. No or... temptation has. <laughs> but he who stands, take heed lest he fall. Yeah. No temptation has come upon you. Such as common to man. Anyway. Okay, Jim, I think you're next. In his study of the causes leading to the Babylonish captivity, Ezra had learned that Israel's apostasy was largely traceable to their mingling with heathen nations. He had seen that if they had obeyed God's command to keep separate from the nations surrounding them, they would have been spared many sad and humiliating experiences. Now when he learned that notwithstanding the lessons of the past, men of prominence had dared transgress the laws given as a safeguard against apostasy. His heart was stirred within him he thought of God's goodness in giving, in again giving his people a foothold in their native land and was overwhelmed with the righteous indignation and with grief at their ingratitude. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, excuse me, Prophets and Kings 620. God intends for us to keep ourselves away from false religions. What would that imply in our day? Do you any any of you know churches around here where there's idols set up in the front, where there's official worship of fertility cults? I uh, read something once. Uh, somebody had studied an Eastern religion, and 
And basically, uh, the artist uh, meditates on his God mm-hmm. until he forms a distinct image in his mind, and then he creates that image, carves it, and then the disciples come and meditate on the carved image to absorb those qualities, the same thing. I see. So the only difference is we don't sit with and st- look at static idols, or they're not creating static idols so much as moving idols and putting the ideas of their God, the qualities of the, their God, you know, lust and greed and power and, and things into those, and then people watch them and absorb those qualities. Are you referring to movies? Yeah, any yeah, movies, TV, any anything that uh, an artist produces. You know, one of the things that people talk about is well, artistic license. You know, I'm an artist. You know, uh, this is just art, and they'll make the most absurd, offensive things and in the name of art. But mm-hmm. uh, why should an artist be not be? Uh, uh, responsible for yeah. controlling what they create. Should we just create anything that we can? Well, okay. that's what they would say. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you a question. How many of us worship exactly the same God? Now, that's a, a trick question. Because the gods that we worship, I, actually, whether we sort of admit it or not, are the mental constructs that we have cons- we have put together in our minds about what what God is? Yeah. We don't we can't see Him, we can't touch Him, we can't ask Him to tell us, except through Scripture. So we each one of us over the years in our Christian experience have put together a mental picture, and that's what we worship. Well, Ellen White had some very interesting, and if you don't hear anything else in this lesson. Listen to this next passage from Ellen White. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and His attributes and are as truly serving a false God as were the worshippers of Baal. Men, even of those who claim to be Christians, have allied themselves with influences that are unalterably opposed to God and His truth. Thus they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. Prophets of Kings 177 and 178. What does that mean? Are we talking about things like Dennis was just talking about? Could be. I remember Dr. Richard Neese, the late Dr. Richard Neese, talking about that we do, we all have some image, but we shouldn't have a graven (laughs) image. It should be a growing, changing, expanding concept of God. Um, so the graven image uh, yeah. sort of well, limits God. He used to put it this way. He used to say, if you're worshiping exactly the same God you worshipped a year ago, you're worshiping a graven image. It's an idol. Yeah. It's an idol. Hmm. If you're, we are here as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, to grow our picture of God and to let it expand and improve on a daily basis. About the infinite one. Yeah. We should st- how much, go for eternity. How much room is there for expansion? Infinite, right? Yeah. Do we sometimes allow fertility cult movies, oh dear, to come into our homes via television or the internet? Well, Ezra, I mean, I'm sorry, Nehemiah had a similar experience to Ezra, Ezra 10. Last, uh, I'm sorry, this is still talking about Ezra. While Ezra was bowing in prayer in front of the temple, weeping and confessing their sins, a large group of Ezraelites, men, women, and children, gathered around him, weeping bitterly. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel of the clan of Elam, said to Ezra, We have broken faith with God by marrying foreign women, but even so there is still hope for Israel. Now we must make a solemn promise to our God that we will send these women and the children away. We will do what you and the others who honor God's commands advise us to do. We will do what God's law demands. It is your responsibility to act. We are behind you, so go ahead and get it done. So what did they do? 
they set up a group to evaluate the situation, to, to deal with each person on an individual basis. And what did they decide? This is a church committee doing this, huh? Yes. A long list of names. They had the list of names of all the people that, that were accused of being guilty of this. And everyone except four, and you read about it in Ezra 10, 18 to 43, all but four of them agreed to follow the instructions. So in our day, it must seem cruel for someone to send away his wife, especially if they had children. But we need to remember that those children were being educated and raised by the wives as shown by the fact that many of them could not even speak Hebrew or Aramaic and thus had no experience with the worship of Yahweh. Moreover, look at Ezra 10, verses 11 and 19. Now then, confess your sins to the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do what pleases Him. Separate yourselves from the foreigners living in our land and get rid of your foreign wives. And then we drop down to verse 19 and it says, uh, they promise to divorce their wives. That's, that's my, trans, my good news translation. And they offered a ram as a sacrifice for their sins. So was this a typical divorce? Well, the specific word used for separate yourselves, badal, and put away, yatha, are not used for divorce anywhere else in Scripture. Thus we can see that it was not Ezra's intent to cause divorces in legitimate marriages. Because these marriages were not established according to biblical principles, Ezra and his associates considered them to be invalid marriages in the first place. So they annulled them. They annulled them. That's like right. The Catholic Church. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Just pay your money and get your annulment. Do we know what happened to those wives and their children? I don't think so, do we? According to the custom of those days, what would have happened was the women, those women would have gone back to their father's home. Back there to be cared for by, by, their, by their parents and uh, un, if and until they were married maybe by somebody else. We know, unfortunately... So, that, so they're not put out onto the streets no. as we've thought of that. No, they were not. Uh, unfortunately, we know that some of those same Jewish men, a few years later, were doing the same thing again in the book of Nehemiah. Hmm. I trust that some of the women that would not have been sent away have already been, quote, converted yeah. and followed the way of the master of the house. Yeah. And their children probably are still with and children. Of if you read through the Old Testament, that was what more or less was expected to happen. So here we have a group of women raising children, claiming that they were married to Jewish husbands, raising children that couldn't even speak their father's language. I mean, was this a real marriage or were they just trying to maybe work their way into the Jewish religion, I mean into the Jewish nation for some financial reasons or some other advantage or whatever? I mean, why would you... I mean, imagine kids that can't even speak the father's language. I mean, well, I have... Well, typically the, the wife wouldn't be the aggressor in this. I, I, I suppose... In, in, terms of like where uh, uh, Balaam caused disruption and women came out and such, that would be one thing, but it would probably be more the, uh, the men of Israel who just were looking around and they went and they saw somebody that pleased them, mm -hmm. you know, like Samson did or, yeah. or uh, some others, and uh, made a deal for that woman to be the wife of his wife. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then he couldn't even speak, they couldn't even communicate, maybe. But no. a, a, a really a devout follower of the Lord above would spend time with his wife and his children. Absolutely. Now, if he wasn't spending time 
those kids wouldn't have learned the language. And it's possible that some of those men just attended their wives and left the country. In fact, if you... Busy working. If you go... If you go into more detail, we're not going to talk about this, but there was one young man who refused to leave his wife, and he got kicked out of the country. So he went with his wife. So that's specifically that's mentioned. That's true love, isn't it? Yeah. Well, hmm. and, you know, I, I think about this because I happen to have a daughter-in-law who's French. And so she speaks French to my granddaughters, and my son, of course, who's an American, speaks English to them, and they speak two languages fluently. Mm -hmm. And there's no problem. And I'm sure all of you know other people that do the same kind of thing. Uh, and kids grow up in, with a blessing, I think, of being able to speak multiple languages. So obviously, there's some serious problem here if these kids can't even speak the father's language. It just, I mean, there's something seriously wrong. Well, why do we as human beings seem to go up and down in recurring cycles in so many different aspects of our lives? Right. What should we learn for our day from these biblical stories about marriage? Well, Paul had something to say about that. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 17. <clears throat> for married people, I have a command which is not my own, but the Lord's. A wife must not leave her husband. But if she does, she must remain single or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. To others I say, I myself, not the Lord. Now I want to interrupt for there a second. Does this mean now this is Paul's words, and so therefore they're not very reliable? We had to cut these out of the Bible? Well, he, he I think he's, he's quoting scripture before and here and I think later on he says something to the effect and I th think that I too have the spirit of God yeah in other words he is he's prophesying I think in the first instance he is quoting prophecy and then after that he is prophesying himself okay for the first passage there he has a very specific reference from Christ yeah and now in this part he says I don't have the specific words about this, but I can tell you as someone who's blessed by the Holy Spirit, and I will give you my advice. Okay, go ahead. Um, if a Christian man has a wife who is an unbeliever and she agrees to go on living with him, he must not divorce her. And if a Christian woman is married to a man who is an unbeliever and he agrees to go on living with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made acceptable to God by being united to his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made acceptable to God by being united to her Christian husband. If this were not so, their children would be like pagan children, but as it is, they are acceptable to God. However, however if the one who is not a believer wishes to leave the Christian partner, let it be so. In such cases, the Christian partner, whether husband or wife, is free to act. God has called you to live in peace. How can you be sure, Christian wife, that you will not save your husband? How can you be sure, Christian husband, that you will not save your wife? Each of you should go on living according to the Lord's gift to you and as you were when God called you. This is the rule I teach in all the churches. Now, so what Paul is saying, if you, are, you as a wife choose to become a Christian and your husband doesn't like it and he's beating you, are you supposed to stay with her? With him, I'm sorry? I mean, just think about these examples. Paul is not saying you have to stay in that kind of a relationship. If, if that person just absolutely doesn't want to have anything to do with you, you're free to go. But if there's a possibility you could stay and the possibility you could even win that spouse um, to God's cause, then do it. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? But to live in peace is mentioned there too. Yeah. So that's the key. You may get along and live in peace without having a whole lot of disharmony. It seems pretty clear that from the actual experiences that we have recorded in Scripture that Ezra and later Nehemiah considered these separations to be singular events that were intended to prevent a syncretism. What's a syncretism? A mixing of religious worship of the true God with paganism. They felt that the future worship of the true God was at risk. 
It is interesting to notice that a contempt that contemporary with these experiences of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, at a place I'm sorry, there was an island located in the southern part of the Nile River at a place called Elephantine, where a group of Jews lived while working for the Persian government. At that site, Jewish men were marrying pagan women, Egyptian women in this case, and they developed a mixed kind of religion in which they worshipped Yahweh along with his pagan consort, the goddess Anat. Goddess Anat. What do we know about her? Well, <clears throat> well, Anat was a goddess of fertility, sexual love, hunting, and war, and as such was rather a paradoxical deity. She was considered to be the mother of the gods, but was also known as the virgin. <laughs> she was sometimes known as the wanton because of her lust for sex and war, the fairest daughter, sister of Baal, the lady, the destroyer, the strength of life, and the lady of the mountain. She also had a number of epitaphs, which seemed to have been peculiarly Egyptian, most notably Anat Her, agreeable Anat, Herat, or yeah, Herat Anata, An, no, Herat Anta, Terror of Anat, and around Elephantine Island, first gnome of Upper Egypt, the Hebrew Bethel, House of God. Wow. And this came from ancient. Ancient Egyptian line. That's, yeah. Online. Dot co dot uk. And if you would be interested in using some of this material in your Sabbath school classes, you can find our handouts on our website at theox, that's T H E O X dot O R G, not dot com dot O R G, theox dot O R G, and you can find this material which you're free to use in your classes. So it is true that while God warns against the possible pitfalls of marrying unbelievers, he is very gracious to those who do and has clear guidelines as mentioned above. In such cases, God never abandons any of his children unless they are running away from him as fast as they can go, insisting on leaving him. Then he gives them freedom of choice. From Ellen White, Prophets and Kings 676. Quote, the word of God abounds in sharp and striking contrasts. Sin and holiness are placed side by side, that, beholding, we may shun the one and accept the other. The pages that describe the hatred, falsehood, and treachery of Sanballat and Tobiah describe also the nobility, devotion, and self-sacrifice of Ezra and Nehemiah. We are left free to copy either as we choose. The fearful results of transgressing God's commands are placed over against the blessings resulting from obedience. We ourselves must decide whether we will suffer the one or enjoy the other. Wow. Prophet and King 676, as you mentioned. Do you think these Jewish men who chose pagan wives were truly committed to worshiping the true God of the Jews? Did they, when they married them, do they think, well, I'll, I'll just convert these wives? Maybe they should have chosen to do that before they married them, huh? Or did they marry these foreign women because they already had leanings in that direction against God? Did these experiences from Ezra and Nehemiah truly change them? I mean, someone comes along and tears out your hair. Does that make a change in you? Sullen submission. Sullen submission, yes. yeah. Your attention, that's for sure. While their behavior may have been changed for a while, there was, was there real change within? Shouldn't those men just have been deported with their wives and children and expelled from the country of Judah? And I've already mentioned that if you read carefully, there was one of the, I think it was a grandson of the high priest that was kicked out with his wife. Uh, what steps can we take today to help those who are in our churches, who are in our churches, but who are married to unbelievers? Should we, should we shun them? Shame them? No. What should we do? Include them. Include them, yes. And what kind of things can we include them in? 
We can invite them to our homes to eat meals, especially Sabbath meals, for example. We can participate with them in things like potlucks and other kinds of activities. Uh, an awful lot of people have been won to the truth by someone just putting an arm around them and welcoming them into the home, treating them as a friend, etc., etc. And I don't need to tell any of you that, I'm sure. Well, does the cultural situation in which we live affect how we should deal with this kind of situation? Well, look at Ezra 9, verse 3. When I heard this, I tore my clothes in despair, tore my hair and my beard, and sat down crushed with grief. Wow. Uh, Some years later, when Nehemiah discovered that it that it had happened again, he tore out the hair and beards of those who had committed the crimes. <laughs> Nehemiah 13, I'll just read that, 23 to 25. At that time, I also discovered that many of the Jewish men had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half their children spoke the language of Ashdod or some other language and didn't know how to speak our language. I reprimanded the men, called down curses on them, beat them, and pulled out their hair. Then I made them take an oath in God's name that never again would they or their children intermarry with foreigners. So Ezra tore out his own hair and Nehemiah tore tore out their hair. Do you think uh, that's a difference in the characteristic of these two men or is it a difference in their idea of how they were carrying out their particular jobs? Remember Ezra was a priest and Nehemiah was what? Governor. He was a governor. Governor, yeah civil leader. Yeah. He was very blunt in comparing their experiences with the experiences of Solomon. He explained to them that their choices would either lead toward God or away from them. And of course, we remember for, uh, Romans fourteen twenty three, where it says that anything that is not based on faith is sin. You're either moving closer to God or you're moving farther away from Him. Considering the fact that Ezra and Nehemiah were trying to reestablish a valid and vital new government in the land of Canaan, it was particularly important that gross sins, such as intermarrying with those idolaters, be stopped as soon as possible. Compare the experience of the children of Israel camped on the plain of Moab, across from Jericho, before entering the promised land, when the fertility cult-worshipping Moabitish women showed up. Read about that in Numbers 25. Wow. Well, Nehemiah had gone back to serve the emperor of Persia after spending about 12 years in Judah. I always wondered, since I mean, they obviously couldn't get on the phone or anything else like this, did the emperor have any kind of... Did, did, was, was Nehemiah able to send any kind of messages back to the emperor? Hey, I'm doing fine, or things are okay here in Judah, or, or did he go 12 years without hearing a word, and then all of a sudden... He shows up at, at the emperor's house again. Did they have some kind of a message service, mail service? I would think they would have must have had some kind of way of communicating. Must have been couriers or something. Yeah. I mean, if a uh, hundred years later, Alexander did. Yeah. Down in he had the Pony Express, so to speak. Yeah. If Persian Empire had Jews down in in southern okay. Egypt yeah. doing stuff. And sending letters. They would be communicating in some way. Very important letters, because those letters, it turns out, they put the Egyptian date and they put the Mesopotamian date on each letter. And so now we can compare them. It's one of the ways we can just nail down a lot of these dates, because we can use the Egyptian system and we use the Mesopotamian system. we We can find out exactly when that happened. It was a great blessing, really, for us. Well, when Nehemiah went back to Susa, probably, in Persia, we don't know how long he was there. But when he returned to Judah once again, it was at that time that he discovered what had taken place. So how should we respond when even church leaders are not wholeheartedly following God? Is it appropriate for citizens to... Speak up against evils? Well, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So, again, Matthew uh, 
18 would apply, and depending on how you, what your relationship was to them, uh, even if you didn't know them, you could at least communicate ways uh, that we do you have think today. Past, do you think pastors today should be bold in dealing with sins the way Ezra and Nehemiah were? It would not go over very well. Well, be branded a troublemaker. Yeah. Did that harsh treatment justify the Pharisees and their behavior in the days of Jesus? Well, clearly, right through Scripture, we are advised to be careful, thoughtful, and prayerful in choosing the ones who marry. Reverence for God and respect for His Word should be the uppermost in our thoughts on such occasions. And if we had time, we would look at Numbers 12, um, Moses had married a Cushite woman. Miriam and Ariam criticized him for it. And what happened? God called them out. And he said, Aaron, Miriam, step forward. The two of them stepped forward. And then God said, the Lord said, now turn, now hear what I have to say. This is God speaking. When there are prophets among you, I reveal myself to them in visions and speak to them in dreams. It is different when I speak to my servant Moses. Now, so is he condemning Moses for taking on a Midianite wife. No. I have put him in charge of all my people Israel. So I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He has even seen my form. How dare you speak against my servant Moses? So clearly God wasn't downplaying or, or, or you know, speaking badly about Zipporah. And she had clearly accepted the Jewish religion. In fact, God defended Moses' marriage very bluntly. Ruth ended up in the genealogy of David and Jesus, and she was a Moabitess. So what should we learn from these experiences of Ezra and Nehemiah to experience the blessings that God wants us to give us wants to give us, we need to humbly accept his guidance in everything we do. Is there anything in your life that you need to talk to talk talk over with God? Should we humbly tremble, tremble before God's word? How can we rededicate our lives as individuals and as churches to the truth about God? Does it help to have an accountable partner as we seek ways to bring about such changes? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these records that have blessed us as we have studied them. Help us to have the courage, not necessarily to speak out boldly as if we were in charge as Nehemiah was, but to look at our own lives and clearly remove from our lives any sins that might be holding us back from entering your kingdom. Help us also to be wise in how we deal with others around us who may be living in sin. Lord, we know that's a very prominent condition in our world today. Help us to know how to relate to it. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.